and a very good morning to our viewers on YouTube this morning. I want you to listen this morning to the words from Psalm 145, verse 10. All your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will praise you. Let's pause for a moment of silence to uh, help us drop the distractions, our agendas, so we can truly praise him today. And I'll pray. Lord, we're thankful for this day. Let our lives be marked by gratitude. You have been so good to us. Find us faithful, Lord, as we praise you this morning. We welcome you this morning, Jesus. And it's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. We are here to worship our Lord and our Heavenly Father this morning. Won't you please stand? And as you do, listen to Revelation 4.11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Let's praise him this morning.
loved you, wanted you. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking for Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is seated at the right hand at the throne of God. Let's sing. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. You became nothing, poured out to death.
Uh, pull out a bulletin. We're going to highlight a few of the things in here, maybe most of it for sake of our folks on YouTube. Um, but on the right-hand side there, you'll notice a few things. The men's work day, uh, Wednesday this week, church, uh, usual Bible study, um, Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. National Day of Prayer is on Thursday. I'm glad for that reminder. I would have neglected that. I encourage you just to take some time during the day, and uh, there's a lot to pray about, isn't there, in the days we're living. Um, so take some time uh, on Thursday, especially dedicate to that. There are two save the date um, notes here, so I want to talk about both of those briefly. Deep cleaning day, uh, you should have, many of you should have received an email kind of lining out what's happening. Um, that is next Saturday, I believe, right, Carolyn? I'm looking so you correct me anything I say wrong. Anything you want to add to, to that? For those who don't have the email, is there a way they can sign up today? You have sheet on the front table and here in the kitchen window. Um, we have about 14 signed up, and we need about 15 more if we can. Okay. All right, good. Thanks, Carolyn. And I think Barb may have something about vacation Bible school. Yeah. Maybe not. She's looking at me. I don't know. No, we have, we have video, but the video, we're going to show you a video next week of what the um, UBS is. But if you have any questions until then or you're interested, just give me a Are you collecting anything for me? No. Not right now. Okay. okay. Thanks, Paul. Um, and note in red again, there's something here, May 20 to 22, building back biblical worldview. Bruce, I don't know if you want to say anything further about that or if that's pretty self-explanatory. Okay. So do take a look at that in the bulletin. Um, okay. I think I got everything in there. So we like to acknowledge um, first-time visitors. I'm sure first-time visitors are always ready for us to acknowledge, but, but we do. We want to know who you are, and I think we have at least one first-time visitor today. I don't know if this has been here before, no. but any first-time visitors today? No? So you have been here before? Okay, I was gone. Okay, look around. No? Okay. Um, birthdays. There's several noted in here. I don't believe uh, Reese um, Brabant is here. Uh, or Sandy Kirchhofer, but I believe there is one here today. Where is Dennis? Oh, there's Dennis. Dennis has a birthday. How, how old are you going to be, Dennis? Well, I'm only going to be 79, but uh, I, find, uh, I just read about a 92-year-old lady in uh, South Carolina that ran the marathon. I did not finish last. Okay. <laughs> so I think that's what I'm going to try to do. That's your goal. Okay. <laughs> Dennis, are you going to start the Swan Valley Marathon? Is that no. Okay. All right. Any birthdays we missed? Uh, we, we want to sing happy birthday, but just look around. Okay. Carolyn's over there, right? Let's sing.
I want to read this morning from Luke 13. Um, first, I'm going to read verses 10 and 11. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. For 18 years, she moved through life looking at the ground. We don't know why she was doubled over. Maybe her griefs and burdens or resentments and guilt weighed her down. Maybe arthritis. Maybe she'd been physically or verbally abused till her twisted up emotions transferred into a twisted up frame. All we know is that she had moved through life like this for 18 years. Bent over so much she couldn't look up. Think about her life, talking to faces she could not see, twisting around to try to see those faces. Did her neck get stiff from trying to look up? Did dust constantly get in her eyes? Think about her sadness. Now I want you to listen to verses 12 and 13. I'll read 10 and 11 again, but pay particular attention to the last couple of verses. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Some translations say your disability. <clears throat> then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. How do you think this woman felt when Jesus called her forward to be healed? Why don't you think she approached him, this renowned healer, like others had, had done? Did she think Jesus wouldn't want to help me, or my problem isn't life-threatening, or maybe God wants me bent over? When Jesus says, woman, you're free, she doesn't stand up immediately. It's only when Jesus lays his hands on her, she straightens up and praises God. Can you imagine, what do you think it was like for her to stand up and the first face she fully saw was the face of Jesus? Were her eyes wide open? Did she stop breathing with a gasp? Did she cry? Do you remember the day Jesus lifted your head and said, You're free. The touch of Jesus. And not just when you received him into your life, as Lord and Savior, but each time you've reached out to him since then. We don't have to wait for Jesus to approach us. We can reach for him. We're free. Praise God. All right, time for our praise and prayer time. I've got a number of things. I know there's been a lot to pray about lately. Uh, if you're on the email list, you know some of these things, but I'll... I will be praying. I'll just mention them and if you have anything additional. But we're highlighting uh, different missionaries we support each month. So I'll be praying for Camp Elohim. Um, Bill Shoup is going through quite a time uh, with his knee, still giving him a terrible time. VBS upcoming. We can't pray too much for that, can we, Barb? Uh, the building permit process. I want to continue to lift up Rick Krantz and pray for him, his heart, and upcoming needs. Ukraine continued uh, need. So, didn't see any requests written and put in the box over there, but any other requests? Uh, see a couple here. So, Lonnie, I'll start with you. Here with you. Thank you.
you on the back? Um, pray for my brother. He's, um, I mean, he's had cancer for a while, and it's kind of been in remission. But recently, I guess he's got this tumor that was in that's broken some of his vertebrae, and they're treating it. But there's some problems with the side effects, and he's having a lot of pain right now. And so just lift him up and pray for healing. Leon, help me out. What's his name? Oh, Arnie. Arnie. Okay, thank you. And I encourage you, you know, our, our prayer time together really is quite brief on Sunday mornings, but, you know, as the Lord stirs your heart and reminds you this week, do continue to pray for these needs, okay? So as we bow our heads, I'll pause in silence. Maybe you had something you weren't comfortable saying out loud, but you can certainly lift it up to the Lord in this time, and then I'll pray for these things. Thank you, Lord, that uh, all these prayers not overwhelming to you at all. You can hear it all, and you care about them deeply. Thank you, Lord, that, uh, that you're there for us. Lord, I, I, I love this, uh, that we're praying now for missionaries we support each month. Certainly want to pray for Camp Elohim, Land and Nicole, uh, their needs that we've listed in the bulletin. And, uh, Lord, these are your servants, so we pray your encouragement in their lives as they give out so much. May they feel a deeper awareness of you in their life, your presence. Pray for people to come and to help them to relieve some of the burden. And, uh, ministry is hard, and so Lord, just pray for good people to help with them and for all their needs, even things beyond what we've listed in the bulletin. Lord, you know their deepest needs, and just pray uh, for a special season of encouragement from the body of Christ as well, Lord, is directly from you. Uh, continue to lift up Bill Shoup and his ongoing needs with that knee that's given him trouble for a while. Lord, we declare for Bill and others that we'll be praying for. You are uh, the great physician and healer. Uh, we thank you for medical folks and what they know, for medicine and all these things. But, Lord, we pray that you would touch Bill and that uh, he could be back on his feet and move beyond this and have a wonderful testimony, Lord, of, of who you are and, and what you've done in his life. VBS is our, a wonderful and perhaps our greatest opportunity to, to reach children, young people uh, in this valley. And so just pray for all the preparation that you would go before and prepare the way, Lord, and for Barb and all that will be helping, uh, that your love would shine so brightly through them that they couldn't help but know that uh, you're real. So we commit our BBS to you for the building permit. We continue to just pray for your hand to push that through, but we trust your timing for physical needs, uh, for Rick Krantz, Lord. Um, just uh, pray you uh, prepare the way, and the same things we pray for Bill, that uh, your hand would be upon him and that, that procedure. Pray that for Rick and for anyone involved, they couldn't help but tell that something was different and that uh, there was something supernatural, uh, Lord, that you were present in that whole situation. Thanks for um, Steve and how his, he's progressed through with this abscess and um, yeah, we're grateful, Lord, uh, for Leon's brother Arnie. Just pray, Lord, you would touch his life and, and uh, he too would be able to move beyond uh, some of this that he's dealt with for a while now. Lord, for when we lose loved ones, uh, we know, for those that know you, they are in a better place, but it's hard on those left behind. So um, we pray for uh, those left behind. Please stand. And as you do so, turn in your handles to hymn number 477. More about Jesus would I know.
assurance and I thought what a contradiction while our hearts are breaking we are given praise honor and glory to our Lord you know Raj in his opening this morning spoke about a miraculous healing of Jesus Christ that's what happened this week you understand that that's what happened Gary, like all of us that are getting older, suffered with health issues. Not anymore. Not anymore. And I have to say, I'm jealous. <laughs> he has seen my best friend face to face. I miss him. I know you all do. I'm envious. And I thank God for bringing him and Barb into our lives when they did. We love you, Barb. Let's continue by taking an offering. And, uh, 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 let's see. Uh, Tom, would you and uh, Lonnie, would you come up and give me a hand, please? Lonnie, would you come on up here and offer me a Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us your inspired word. You have given us Pastor Bruce to help us to understand your word. We give you all the thanks for your blessings. And we, we also ask that you watch over all of us each and every day. Today we bring gifts to you. We know that you will use those gifts to Bring forward more of your word to more people who are unchurched and perhaps are non-believers. We ask that you keep us in your sight at all times. We ask all these things in your name. Heavenly Father, help us as we struggle to understand and to praise the death of Gary Brown. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.
Thank you, Carolyn. Well, we're in Romans chapter 8. Kind of while I'm getting prepared, I was thinking about Roger's opening this morning. And again, he did share a story about a healing that uh, Jesus, one of the many healings Jesus uh, accomplished while he was here on earth. When Carol and I lived in Alaska, we lived in the small town of Palmer, Alaska. And there used to be a lady that we'd see up there quite often, and she wasn't an elderly lady. I, I would say a middle-aged lady, wouldn't you say so? Of course, I, I'd get to the point where middle age is anybody 65 or, or under. <laughs> so, but I, I think she was probably in her 40s. And whenever you saw her, and you saw her on the street a lot, and she was bent all the way over at the waist, just bent straight over going down the street. I always think about it. Those verses you shared with us, uh, except, except on rare occasions you would see her, and she was rigid, straight up, walking down the street. Mental issue, I, I really don't know. I, I just, I never found out. But that's not something that a person would do to put on an act. I mean, you bend over and then try to walk like that. Maybe did all the time, just. I, I don't know, but uh, I always recall those verses. That's uh, I don't know. It's a, it's amazing how perhaps Saint had afflicted her. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but there was there was some issue there. It may not have been physical. It may have been mental. But anyway, would you like to look at Romans eight verses ten through thirteen today? Would you like to do that? I hope so, because that's the only message I prepare. <laughs> When we were last, we weren't in the book of Romans last week. We appreciate Lloyd and Suzette being up here. But when we were in the book of Romans last, the apostle made this distinction between the fallen, sinful, non-believer's life and the spiritual life of the Christian. And we came to a conclusion. He drew us to a conclusion based back on verse 8 when he said, those who are in the flesh, in other words, when we hear that word flesh, Think sin, sinful nature, those who are unconverted, non-believers, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. In other words, those who remain unconverted, those who still identify by the sin nature, are in such a state that nothing they can do will please God. Even what I would call the normal unbeliever's prayer is not satisfactory to God because it does not come from the heart. Maybe you've experienced this before your conversion, or I know I have, or even when I was just a very weak Christian and I've known non-believers who end up in some kind of peril, something tragic happens to them, and all of a sudden they're praying. But it is not from the heart. It's just a desperation to try to find some kind of relief for what's occurring in their life, and it is not pleasing to God. There is nothing, the apostle says, that we can do in an unredeemed state that will please God. So we're going to look at Romans 8 again, beginning in verse 12, and I want to start off just reading, uh, uh, let me back up, Romans 8, starting in verse 10, and I want to just start off reading verses 10 and 11, but as always, before we go to scripture, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I I do just lift this time up to you, Lord. I thank you so much for all you do in our lives as we enter this communion Sunday. I just can't help but to think about the sacrifice that your son made for each and every one of us. I think about your plan of salvation, Father, and just how simple you made it for us, but how difficult we make it. So I just pray as we read these words here today that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts and minds to them. They would indeed be a guide to our life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 10, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit, who dwells in you. So back again a couple Sundays now, but back in verse 9, Paul made one of his profound statements there. He referred to the Holy Spirit in one place as the, as the Spirit of God, and he also referred to it as the Spirit of Christ. So Paul makes it clear 
that the Spirit is the means by which Jesus himself indwells each one of us if we are indeed a believer. And it is through the Spirit, through the Spirit, that Christ can indwell us. And if Christ is in you, you are alive in the Spirit, even though while our physical bodies are perishing, even though while we are dying because of sin. Because remember, death came into the world because of sin. Didn't it? So we die because of sin. Now that may seem a little confusing, but I want to go into it in a little more detail as we go along here. You see, the problem is, our bodies have yet to be redeemed. As a consequence, our bodies are the source of sin that even we as believers still struggle with. That's why our bodies lust, that's why our minds may react with hate or with hostility. Sin finds its source in our bodies. And that is why our bodies grow old and will eventually die. The sin that pervades our unredeemed bodies is physically killing us. Now, on the other side of the coin, if you're not a Christian, death is your entire story. Both physically and spiritually. You are still in Adam. You are not in Christ. Your body is dead. And so is your spirit. Everything about you is falling apart is going to continue to do so. That is the life of the non-believer. But if you are in Christ, only your unredeemed body is in death. And guess what? It is going to be redeemed. One day it is going to be redeemed, just as God raised His Son, Jesus Christ, to a glorified, perfected body, we have the same thing to look forward to. But even now, our spirit is alive because of the gift of righteousness through Jesus Christ. Christ is in you, and you are linked to him. You know, Paul put it beautifully in his book to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16, when he said, though outwardly, speaking of our physical bodies, he said, though outwardly we are wasting away, Yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. The Spirit of God within us is stronger than the sin that is in our bodies. So even though our bodies are wasting away, the Spirit is increasingly giving us strength to control our bodies. That's the point that Paul made back in verse 11. I want to read it one more time. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. You know, some commentators have a difference of opinion about this verse. They look at it from two perspectives. Some say that this verse refers to the promised resurrection of our physical bodies that is going to come one day. When God will make our bodies alive once more. When our bodies will, at that time, be redeemed. But others argue that he is talking about the Spirit in us, giving life to our mortal bodies in the here and now. Well, you know I'm pretty simple. It seems to me that both are in view. Both are true. One of them is occurring right now, and one of them is certainly going to occur, uh, going to occur at a future date. Our human spirit is being made alive right now in Jesus Christ. And the spirit is what is going to give us the strength to say no to the temptation to sin. We can't reverse this physical process that we're going through. No one can. Our bodies one day are going to die, except if you come to Sunday school, you know unless Jesus Christ returns first, right? You know that. These people come to Sunday school, they know a lot of stuff. You've got questions, you, you ask them, they know. But unless Christ returns first, we are someday going to die. But we can refuse to let the members of our body become instruments of sin. We can refuse 
by the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling us. We can refuse to let our hands, our eyes, our tongues, our brains, or any of the rest of our bodily parts be used for evil purposes. Scripture makes it plain. God, when we're tempted, God gives us a way out. Look at verse 12 and 13. So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are put into death the deeds of the body, you will live. When Paul says, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die, he literally means that if you are living apart right now from God, if you are a non-believer, if you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, then your present existence is one of a walking death. We've talked about this before. I mean, you name it. All of the things that come about from not having Jesus Christ in your life, you experience those, and they are, they are a form of a living death that the non-believer experiences daily. But if you live by the Spirit and put to death the sins of the body, you will truly live. You can experience authentic life. Jesus said when he came to earth, I came to give you life more free and more abundant. And that is available to the believer. I think ultimately that's going to be satisfied when we are in the eternal kingdom with him. But it is available now in terms of security, fulfillment, vitality, joy, peace. Paul stresses... That authentic living takes place only by means of the Holy Spirit. And by believing the Spirit of God, what He has said, that is how you live by the Spirit. That's how you live by faith. When you believe that the sins of the body can be controlled by the power of the Spirit, then you can say no to the temptation to sin. A person who lives by the Spirit can do all of those things. You can make money, you can have fun, you can gain fame, you can find fulfillment in life, and through it all, God will be glorified. The righteousness which the law demands is fulfilled in those who are indwelt by the Spirit of Christ, not by those who walk by the flesh. You know, this process is an interesting word here if you're a King James uh, Version uh, Bible reader, you'll be familiar with it, but this process of putting to death the sins of the body, it's what earlier theologians used to call mortification, and they got that from the King James Version of the Bible, from this verse 13, if you were reading along in the King James, it would say, if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. So, what does this verse tell us about this process of mortification? How does it occur? How do, how do we do that? Well, first, this is one thing where we need to understand the Greek a little bit more. It means a ruthless, full-hearted resistance to sinful practice. The word translated in the Greek, put to death, in the Greek, it, it is violent and it is total. It means to reject totally everything that we know is wrong. It means to declare war on attitudes and behaviors that are wrong, to give them no quarter, to take no prisoners, to pull out all stops. This means, folks, that as Christians, we do not play games with sin. We don't say, I'm going to slowly try to wean myself off of it. We don't have the thought I can keep it under control. You get as far away from it as is possible. The Bible in no uncertain terms tells us to flee from sin. You don't just avoid things that you know are sin. You avoid things that lead to sin. And even things that are doubtful. As the scripture tells us, we are in spiritual war. If you have had habitual sin in your life and there are places, are times, are people that you know are going to lead you to that sin, flee. Don't ever let it 
get started. Avoid it completely. Second, it means changing our motivation to sin by remembering to apply the gospel. We're going to talk about this a little more next week. Do you understand the gospel of Jesus Christ? You certainly heard it in this church. You understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about it a little later on. We're going to go to communion. What Jesus Christ did for us. Probably in next week's message, I am going to challenge you to preach to yourself. Give yourself many sermons when sin's temptation comes upon you. Remember to apply the gospel. This process of mortification goes deep, deeper than merely resisting sinful behavior. It looks at the motives of the heart. Verse 12 says, we are under obligation. But to what? Not to the flesh. It's a crucial statement, and it refers to the statement before in which Paul tells us that we have been redeemed by Christ's righteousness and that someday will be totally delivered from all the evil and the pain that we have experienced in the bodily resurrection. Then Paul turns to us and he says, we have an obligation. You know, in some translations it says we are debtors. We have an obligation. We are debtors, but not to the flesh, not to sin. Paul means that if we remember what Christ has done and what he will do, we will feel an obligation for love, for gratitude, to serve him, and to know him. Paul is saying that sin can only be cut off at the root if we expose ourselves constantly to the unimaginable love of Jesus Christ. This exposure should stimulate continual gratitude, thankfulness, feelings of indebtedness. Sin grows. Boy, this is a timely, this is a timely reference to the verse. Sin grows in the soil of self-pity. And a feeling of a, of a phrase that Bible scholars use called oldness. You know what oldness is? Today we would probably say entitlement. I am not getting a fair shake. I am not getting my needs met. I have had a hard life. God owes me. People owe me. I owe me. That's the heart of self-pity. That's an attitude of oldness. That's an attitude of entitlement. But Paul says we must remind ourselves that we are debtors. If you constantly live in a state of amazement and remembrance of the grace of God, that will loosen, that will weaken, and that will kill them at the motivational I want to close with this thought. We kill sin, sin in the spirit when we turn from sinful practices, when we mortify them, when we are ruthless in dealing with our temptations to sin. And turn our heart from sinful motivations by reminding ourselves of the size of the debt that we owe to a loving and gracious God by obedience to that spirit of Christ and dwell in us. And what a sad way to go into communion. We go into that time where at least once a month, and I hope you do it every day, but at least once a month we just pause to thank God for his plan of salvation, to thank our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for carrying it out. And I hope I hope that when we consider the awfulness of the cross and what he went through even before he was ever placed on that cross, the humility, the degradation, the pain, and the suffering, and then to be, I hope we understand the size of our sin that had to be dealt with. It's a debt we could never repay. Never. 
accept his free gift of salvation. Come say thank you. Thank you, Lord. So I'm going to ask Leon and Raj if they would come up and give me a hand, please. And we are going to go into that time of communion. And I hope, folks, that it is a serious and a meaningful time for you. I try to remind you that you don't have to be a member of Common Community Church to partake. Scripture tells us that we need to be a child of God. If you have taken that step to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would invite you to join us at this time. So, Leon, could I ask you to offer a prayer for the body of bread, please? Heavenly Father, we come before you in this time of remembrance, and I just pray that you will... Just allow us to, to give our thanks now for what Jesus did for us on the cross. To really appreciate the suffering he went through. Of taking our sin and putting it on, on his account as it were. And the, the suffering he went through, his body being broken. We thank you that, that he accomplished that for us. And I just pray as we take this remembrance that you will just Again, just impress on us that great sacrifice that was made on our behalf. In Jesus' name. Amen. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and beginning in the 23rd verse. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Please partake. our heart to think of what you suffered you shed blood on the cross but we also know that without shedding blood there's no forgiveness of sin so Lord we land on gratitude and we say thank you as we remember you during this special time of communion thank you Lord in Jesus name Amen. Amen. in verse 25 in the same way he took the cup also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. It's perfect. And verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're we just stand here one more time just trying to express in words the gratitude, the love that we have for you, for your son, your plan of salvation, his sacrifice. And it always just seems so small, Lord. But, but we're at loss, I'm at loss to express what it really means to me, Father. And we always, we always struggle with the sadness of this event when we think about it, but I pray that we would always consider the sweetness. Because of your plan of salvation and because you have prompted each and every one of us through your Holy Spirit to accept you as our Lord and Savior, we can spend all of eternity with you, Father. What a gracious and glorious time that's going to be. Thank you. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Well, these gentlemen are going to come around, and they're going to collect the cups. I'm going to give them a chance to get somewhat out of the way. And we're going to do something we haven't done in two years. You want to confess what you haven't done in two years? We haven't stood up, circled around and held hands because we love each other. That is not optional. All right? So we're going to do that today. And I'm going to go off the microphone shortly. You're not going to have to hear me sing that.
But some of you are going to have to come up the stage. That was a problem we had before. Nobody wants to come up on the stage with a pastor. Some of you are going to have to hold the pastor's hand. So. All right. Let's go. Leon, would you close us in a word of prayer? Would you start us off with a song? We need a bigger dose. There's something. There's something missing.